Hi, Jane. Welcome to the sisterhood. Thank you for having me. Well, we're so excited to have you and a fun fact about you is that you and your husband have taken your life on the road. So we were just chatting about that. And I thought it'd be just fun for our listeners to hear what you're doing. Well, we decided we had had this kind of this bucket list dream of, yeah, someday when we retire, let's sell everything, buy a motorhome, and travel the country. And we kind of put that aside. You have kids and you have grandkids and your time seems to be taken up more with going, you know, visiting your grandkids or seeing them. And then when our daughter decided to move her family clear across the country from the West coast to the East coast, my husband and I looked at each other one night and said, why not? Let's do that thing that we talked about so long ago, sell everything, buy a motorhome, and we're traveling the country. Yeah. It's just so fun. I love that little fact about you. I had to just mention it before we get into our topic. Um, but one of the things that, you know, you, you write and you speak, and one of the ways that I even found you was through your book about caregiving for your parents and just what that season was like for you. So as we were looking at this midlife series and this midlife is no joke, um, we really see this as a central part where we know cognitively that someday our parents are going to age. We know that everyone does. We're all on the clock. None of us are getting out of here alive, but when it happens, it's almost as if it's a surprise because we are so used to being in that parent child relationship, even as adults, we still see our parents as parents. And so can you just explain a little bit about that transition and how even we experience that and how you experience that? When I look at that transition, that it it's, it's a slow, for most of us, it's a slow transition. I, I still have this picture in my head of my dad, young, vibrant, proud, um, walking through Disneyland, just super happy to be able to take his family to on a Disneyland trip. So different from the, from the, what the way he looked before he died. And so when you're transitioning into this role of, of caregiver, it's, it's really like walking on eggshells. Um, when I, especially when I think about my daughter, I don't, I don't want my daughter to treat me like one of her kids. And I think that we have to be really careful as we transition from that child to almost parent relationship to our parents that we don't treat them like children. We have to respect them for, for their position. You know, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. So we honor them yet. We have to, Oh, it's so difficult. You have to take this, this different role and, and navigating it is, is, is rough. It's, it's rough, but it, it can be done. Well, and as I, as I'm even thinking about that in my own head, I mean, what are some ways that we maybe offer that respect or honor while at the same time, encouraging them to, for example, let's say they're doing a set of stairs and they really need to be holding onto the handrail because I mean, our fear, right. We just want them around. Like we just sure. like, I always like say, bottom line is don't die. Like I say that to my parents, like bottom line is I'm, I just don't want you to die. I really don't. Cause I still want you here. So that's my like motivation for everything. But you know, how do you offer that while at the same time, like kind of offer, um, help in that moment right? So let's just use the stairs moment. Cause stairs is like a big thing. So how do you offer that without overstepping? There's, that's a really good question <laughs> because I think that what, what we're going to find is that, is that you will make mistakes. So there will be times where you're overstepping. There will be times where you've hurt feelings. There will be times I know that when my feelings were hurt, when my mom snapped at me, I don't need your help or, you know, go get me this. And, and my feelings got hurt. It's just, I mean, I think, I don't think you can avoid those because it's all about the give and take of relationships, just mm -hmm. like 
when our parents parent us, they don't, sometimes they, they, they're angry and they don't respond well to us when they're, when they're parenting us kind of the same thing. They're going to respond in a way that may be hurtful until they realize that, you know, for instance, the stairs, mom, can I help you with the stairs? No, I'm fine. I can do it myself. Okay. Until mom maybe realizes she can't do it herself. And so we have to allow them that, that latitude to, to transition themselves because it's, it's a transition for them too. Wow. It's just Mm -hmm. like, it's just like teenagers. You got to allow them. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, but we're not parenting them. No, we're not parenting them. Uh, But I think that's a good word to start with Jane is that we're not parenting. We are maybe coaching is, you know, I think of a lot of the issues I hear of when my peers are talking about their parents, a lot of the things just have to do with operating in a world that's more digital, more technical. And so there are things like practical things that um, we might need to help our parents with just because the world has changed and they're not used to it yet. But then there's things about them changing either physically or mentally, they aren't able to care for themselves in the same way. And I wonder if, having that visual of being side by side and coaching as they do things, if that's the appropriate way to offer respect and honor, and yet maybe also some practical help, um, some knowledge or even some physical help as they uh, maneuver through the world. Would you say that it's true? I would. And, um, Uh, I totally lost my train of thought, but I want to go back to just thinking about my mom and in the area of finances. So Mm -hmm. my mom suffered from macular degeneration. So before, as it progressed, she was no longer able to write checks out. My mom loved Mm -hmm. writing physical checks and balancing her (laughs) checkbook. I mean, you know, who does that? But anyway, so Mm -hmm. um, I offered to help her and I suggested to her that maybe we should try doing the bills online and that it would save time and that she could show me the ones she wanted to have paid, et cetera, et cetera. So she let me take her into the 21st century by paying her bills online, but she wanted still every month, she wanted to get that paper statement and she wanted me to help her balance her checkbook on the back of the statement like we used to do. So there's a give and take just in any relationship of I can, let's try this, but I will be okay with doing this. Yeah, that's great. I was thinking about how in your book you talk about, and and I I just see tones of this and I just wanna name it. You talk about how really in this caregiving season for our parents, we have the opportunity to become more like Christ. And that is something that I think is a beautiful vision for, for us personally to adopt that as we enter this season with our parents, I mean, what a beautiful way for us to think about it, that, wow, this is a great opportunity for me to become more Christ-like. And I want that. And I want to treat my parents in that way. Ooh, I'm going to get teary in this episode because my parents are super dear. Why am I crying? <laughs> because want- it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. And I want to reflect Christ to them. Okay. So Jane, talk to me about that. How do we grow in Christ like this as we care for our parents? When when my mom was no longer able to, after my dad died, we started having my mom come down to our house. We lived just like four houses away. So we would have my mom come down for dinner and we felt like it was good for her to get out of the house. We could go down, walk her down to our house, have her eat and then go home. After a while, it became physic. she became physically unable to walk down to our house. So my husband and I would fix dinner at home and schlep that stuff down to her house. So we'd carry the crock pot and the salad bowl and the side dish and everything down to her house. And we would complain to each other. Frankly, we would complain to each other. 
I'm so tired of this. This is, ah. and then we would have to remind ourselves and each other, this is a temporary season. Mom is going to pass. This is God's grace. This is a way for us to show God's grace to my mom. And maybe other mothers are not this way, but my mom was super grateful that not only did we bring her a hot meal, but also that we sat with her and we ate and we talked. So leaving her house after, you know, schlepping down there complaining and then realizing it's God and then leaving her house going, okay, that was God's grace. This was our way to show um, as the Bible says, to show you know, the widows and the orphans, to care for the widows and the orphans. I mean, I'm not saying that it was easy, but mm -hmm. I would saying that it is, I saw Christ at work as those, as those selfish pieces that didn't resemble Christ were, were chipped off sometimes with, with a little fine, um, you know, tool and sometimes with a hammer. I do think there's this odd dynamic where, because they're our parents, they've always given more than we have as kids, right? Just like we as yes. parents give so much more really to our kids, right? Then we're going to receive back. It's just the nature of the relationship. And so in some ways, I think we actually are a little bratty about, you know, the flip because yeah. we're used to being the ones that are the receivers, not the givers in that relationship. Now in, you know, in our families, if we have children, we're used to being the givers in most. And so in some ways it's an attitude check in our own hearts of, we have been on the receiving end of this relationship. And now here is an opportunity that we have to become the givers and to give back what they have generously given to us. But that requires an intentional flip. It feels like it requires a total mindset shift. Well, it goes back to honor your father and your mother. I mean, when you're children, you honor your parents by obeying them. Mm -hmm. As an adult, as you're caring for your parent, you're honoring them by caring for their needs um, and taking care of them as they took care of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say probably the, the attitude of the person, you said your mom was very grateful. Mm -hmm. that the attitude of the person can make a big difference. I mean, I have friends whose parents just got really cranky as they aged. Right. And then you yeah. are, so, <laughs> um, you're going through the motions of serving them and stepping aside from your other life responsibilities to serve them. So I just want to recognize that that may be a dynamic in some of our listeners, families, well, and especially if your mom or your dad is suffering from dementia, because mm -hmm. that will cause a complete personality change. And that can cause that crankiness and kind of irritability. And, and, and that's, that is a whole different dynamic that thankfully I didn't have to face. Well, let's talk about that. Cause I think that is super real that we may lose our parents before their bodies fail. So we may lose them mentally and emotionally before we lose them physically. So what, what do you do when that happens? Because that is, it's really hard when someone has dementia and they don't, they aren't who they used to be. A lot of the people that I had talked to when I was writing my book had said the same thing that the, the personality change was just made them heart sick because here their, their loving and caring mom or dad was now this cranky person. And this is where that grace, you know, finding the grace that Christ gives us to, to deal with that, to show love in the face of someone who's not being loving and to show grace in the face of someone who's not being graceful. I'm, I'm also thinking of the way that, um, my, my parents' bodies failed so much before they eventually passed. And, you know, like I said, I remember my dad taking us to Disneyland and jumping in the car to go on a road trip and then to see him in a wheelchair hunched over and, and face just clenched with pain or my mom um, always in pain because she had hurt her back and being unable to, to do the things that she once enjoyed. Um, part of that showing grace uh, that I 
that I was going to say before was that, you know, in, in me helping with her with her checkbook is kind of like, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this online banking thing. But then my mom loved to bake. And so my mom had macular degeneration. So a lot of her baking was not um, great in those latter days, but just letting her go ahead and, and make baked goods and have me take them to the doctor, even though the baked goods were not super great. You know, it's just, it's, it's that grace. I don't, I, it's hard to explain, but I, I, I know that God gives us the grace that we need at the time when we need it. Yeah. I really believe that giving the grace in the moment that we need it and not before it's true. Let's talk about, as you were saying, and even, even with your parents, as they were physically failing and, um, there's a lot of depression that comes often with aging and how do we recognize even in our parents, some severe depression or when they might need help? This is an area where it's really important to have a good relationship with your mother and or your dad's doctor. I was really blessed to be able to have a family doctor who was my parents' doctor, my doctor, and my children's doctor, not when they were older. <laughs> so we we had this three generations of of the doctor knowing us. And I, I don't want to I don't want to say that he caused, you know, he violated any HIPAA things, but I could go with my mom to the doctor and be able to converse with him. And he was comfortable knowing that I had my mom's best interest at heart because he did talk to my mom about depression. I know my dad was depressed, but you know, men, men, especially German men do not talk about that type of thing, but um, the doc, it, it's really important to have that doctor relationship that you can um, ask the doctor, do you, do you think my mom needs medication? Is there anything that we can do for my mom to help alleviate that, that, or is it, is it just aging? I mean, we don't know unless we talk to a professional. What would you say about situations like car keys where someone's losing their independence and they are not wanting to, and they are, you know, fighting you on, they're like, no, I mean, cause it's true. Driving equals independence for people. And that is really hard to swallow. And yet the reality is that, I mean, even just yesterday, my son was, I can't actually can't drive right now. Cause I just had knee surgery and my son was driving me and literally we were a millimeter from a major accident because this elderly woman pulled out, you know, she wasn't paying attention. So the reality is that there is a moment where they're, they become a hazard to themselves and others in the car. And yet to take the keys away is brutal. So how, give us some tips on that. I feel looking back, I, I feel like maybe I could have handled that whole situation better. I feel like um, when you're caring for your parents, it, it can become just another task. Like I have something else that I need to accomplish. I need to check it off the list. So dad is having a problem driving. We need to take care of the problem. Let's fix it and check it off the list. Uh, I, I have a friend, her name is Raina Nisus, and she wrote a book called No Regrets. And I don't have regrets caring for my caring for my parents. I do have some regret looking back of that whole key situation. Perhaps it could have been, perhaps if I had taken longer to solve the problem rather than looking at it as a task. You know, let's let's take dad's car keys away end of story, check the box, move on to the next issue. I, I think I failed to see my dad as, as a whole person. And, you know, instead of talking to him about what his driving experience would be, I mean, my dad probably started driving the combine when he was 10, when he was old enough to see over the dash. So here I am 
you know what, and he's like 86 and, and he's been driving for, you know, 76 years and I'm here going, well, dad, you know, we got to take care of this little issue. You ran into the side of the garage a couple of times and you kind of, you know, went into the wrong lane. So let's take care of this problem. And, you know, my dad here, here's a man who not only had been driving for a long time, he loved to drive. Part of the reason I love to ride in this motorhome is because I took so many road trips as a family with my dad and my brothers. My dad was the first one to hop in the car. He'd say, give me 10 minutes. I'll pack my bag. We're going to be on the road. And I'm wondering if I could have extended the time of discussing the car key issue so that maybe it would have been a smoother transition and my dad wouldn't have felt so keenly that I was taking something away from him, rather letting him make the decision that he should probably think about not driving. Does that make sense? Yeah, it gets to all of the things that we've kind of touched on as far as the relationship and doing things gradually and maybe also putting us in a position where we have some responsibility and there's safety involved, and yet we don't want a parent. I mean, it just, I think it's a great example of all of those different dynamics and stressors that come together uh, to have those hard conversations. And how do we maneuver through them with gentleness and tenderness and care for the person and the responsibility we have as this person's child, adult child, to mm -hmm. maybe speak into um, a safety issue that won't just impact them, but potentially could impact other people like Krista and her son yesterday. Like, how do we do that? And it's, it's just like you said at the beginning, it's messy and there's probably no one right way to do it. But if we lead with honor, honoring who they are and who they've been, then it's going to go better. I would say than if we just kind of attack it, as you said, as a problem. And I, and I want to say, you know, probably you were at a stage of your life where you were really busy with lots of other responsibilities at that point. And I think that's where some of those tension points come in when we're uh, caring for somebody that we haven't maybe needed to care for in such great detail is that we're also at a phase of life that maybe we're really busy at work we're really busy with older kids. And so we have to recognize for ourselves too, this is another person that is needing our attention. It's a joy and an honor to give our parents added help and attention. And at the same time, we can realistically look at our lives and say, maybe the reason why we're grumbling or it's causing tension is just because we're exhausted. Well, the season of time that I was going through at that particular point, I had just found out that my 30, my 29 year old son was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So I can, I can maybe give myself a little bit of slack with that uh, because it, that was obviously a really difficult time. So I had those two tensions going on at the same time. And, and I think too, that's why having those conversations with our parents early on is never going to be too early. I, you know, for instance, my daughter, my, I'm staying here near my daughter. She's in her forties. I'm in my sixties. We've briefly touched on what are you going to do when you can no longer, you know, drive around in your motorhome all the time. But now really is the time where I should be having the conversation with my daughter about this is how I want to end my life. This is how I want to see my last days, where I want to be and, and continue those, continue those conversations from now going forward, because I don't think we, we have com these conversations because they're difficult and we don't do it early enough. We kind of slide into this into this caregiving season and we don't have a roadmap and we're stumbling and we're fumbling and we're making mistakes and we're hurting feelings instead of preemptively bringing those 
those things up while we're having a family dinner, while we're celebrating Christmas. Um, you know, we're, when we're, when we're eating a meal or, or driving in the car, I think we don't even know what questions to ask is part of the problem. <laughs> and so, yeah. I mean, what, what questions do you ask? I mean, obviously there's some of the obvious ones, like you were referring to, like, where do you want to be? Mm -hmm. Where do you want to live? And that is hard because sometimes even that question is loaded, right? Cause some people want to stay in their homes until the day they die. Right. Some people, right. And so, but yeah. really they need to be in a facility where they can be cared for, um, maybe on a regular basis, things like that. So even that can be a hard conversation, but beyond that, beyond even physical, physical location, what other questions should we be asking? Things like, have you made arrangements for long-term care? Or do you have a long-term care policy? Have you, do you have an advanced medical directive? Um, you know, do not resuscitate somewhere. If you do, where, where is it? That would be good for my daughter to know in case something should happen to me and my husband. Um, what about, you know, do you have a trust? Mom and dad, do you have a trust? Do you, where, how can I access any money I might need to access if you become inca incapacitated? Where do you do your banking? I mean, it sounds so invasive, like, mom, where do you do your banking? Well, mm -hmm. that's none of your business, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it kind of is. I mean, my husband and I driving in this motorhome, we could be hit by a semi at any time. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter has no idea where we have our money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she has no idea where our life insurance policies are. I mean, these are the kinds of things that really truly is never too early to start asking, even though it is one of the most difficult things to ask is, you know, cause we're talking about death. Basically mm -hmm. we're talking about either death or incapacitation. So, yeah. you know, how fun is that? Hey, mom and dad, let's talk about your death. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Let, this is great dinner conversation. Thanks, you know honey. what though? It is practical. I mean, mm -hmm. one, if they have a financial planner, you can then be connected, get connected to that financial planner because they're really, you know, dialed into everyone's stuff. Right. So that's, that would be helpful. But even my husband and I, he's a big mountaineer <laughs> a long time ago because he's climbing mountains and going to Nepal and doing things, service trips. And, and I'm like, you need to do a document that says, if I die, here's where you find everything. Mm -hmm. And I did, I had him do an Excel spreadsheet that tells me if he's gone, this is how I find everything. Because I mean, there's a lot of, you know, we have our roles and there's a lot of things he does that I don't know how to do. And so, because he just does them. So that, that even having a document like that on an Excel spreadsheet seems like it would be helpful. Well, in our, the gal who did our trust said that in the back of the trust is a place where we can put all of our banking information, passwords, you know, all of this information and stuff. And then, you know, make sure that it's in a safe place where my daughter would know what it is. Well, you know, being lazy as we are, we put that stuff we put it away. We are like, I'll deal with that later. Cause I have plenty of time. And then, you know, you may not have plenty of time and then your loved ones are left with no idea. Mm -hmm. So as we're talking, I'm thinking, man, <laughs> I need to get that document out and fix that and give it to my daughter. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if it's a hard conversation to bring up, to do a little bit what Krista did to say, you know, we could die at any time too. And then say, I'd like to give you our information. If mm -hmm. you can give us your information, then mm -hmm. it might not seem so much like mom and dad, you're about to die. We need to know where everything is. You know, I mean, it may yeah. not feel so abrasive to just say, it's just good for all of us to have that kind of prep in place because we all could be in a car accident tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And during COVID, my mom was, I think, a little bit like, oh, I better get everything in order. And so she put everything in a notebook. So I know where the notebook is in her house and I can go and access it. And I think that maybe just having one place, like you said, where in the back it has all of the accounts and all of the passwords. And um, and then she also, and this is to her credit because she was proactive in this. She added me to as many accounts as she could that that made sense for us so that if I needed to easily access things um, right. that so it's those like taking those next steps of how can we care for each other 
mm-hmm. because she's single. So I'm her, her person I'm married. So I have a person in case something happens to me, but she should also be in that loop in case something happens to me and my husband. I, I'm just thinking about it out loud too, as we're mm-hmm. talking like, huh, maybe I have some work to do. I think, I think all of your listeners now have homework. Is That's we're right. All, we're all going to go and mm-hmm. get that stuff out and write it down and share it. So mm-hmm. that, this is good. Yeah, it's really good. What, what do you say, you know, some are in harder financial situations than others and financial strain in the elderly years can be really hard because, you know, some kids feel like they have to take the whole brunt, but maybe not all the siblings even agree. And, you know, that gets to also some siblings may be caring for their parents more than others. And that can feel unfair whether it's financially or just emotionally and in time and resources. And so how do you, how do you navigate that with siblings? The whole, it kind of goes back to that whole sibling rivalry thing. Separate from the financial part of it, I was, I was extremely resentful of my brothers because I was the one who had the bulk of the caregiving fall to me. Um, my one brother who's nine years older than I am and has no kids and he and his wife lived probably 30 minutes away, same town, but just, you know, across town and never rarely came to visit mom and never asked if they could offer respite, never did anything vaguely resembling, Hey, can we take mom off your hands for a few hours or, or a day? And I, Part of it, I realized as, you know, God does such a work, you know, here I am, I'm feeling so resentful of my brother and my other brother lives in the Bay area and I'm resentful. But what the Lord showed me through that is that I felt like, no, I'm going to take care of mom. You guys, you guys are boys. I'm going to take care of mom. I'm the one who's here. I see what she needs. You don't. So kind of like, don't leave, just leave me alone. So I had this kind of come here, put, go away thing going on in my mind. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I didn't, I never even asked, I should have just asked for help Mm -hmm. and I didn't. And that's the, the thing where that God showed me is that resentment was bubbling up inside me. And it was really my own fault. Totally. My brother, my brother could have said, no, my brother and his wife, very financially stable. My other brother and his wife, very financially stable here. Mike and I we're trying to, you know, go through this death of our son and losing jobs and, you know, all of this Mm -hmm. stuff and caring for my mom. So part of it would be, you know, really to talk, if you can talk to your siblings about the expectations, if you, if you can't, you know, if you can't be here physically to give us a night off, could you pay for somebody to come in and give some respite care to, so we could have a night off or, Towards the end, I think my other brother's wife who lives in the Bay Area got on his case because he started coming up once a month and staying the weekend with my mom to give my husband and me a break. So, you know, those sisters-in-law are priceless. We love them. (laughs) Well, and I like what you said there because I think it gets back to our personal boundaries. And sometimes we just don't do a good job. We're not good about asking for, and I'm preaching to myself here, not good about asking for what we need for not identifying what we need, first of all, and then asking for it and saying, you know what, this is what, this is what I've agreed to do. And I'm wondering what could you agree to do considering some of the needs there that are at hand here. And so, you know, it's, it's so much of it comes back to being a direct communicator and being able to name our needs and boundaries. And I just think, man, if we could get a hold of those things, we would all be so much better off. Cause then we just don't have to fight that bitterness because we're actually bringing it to the light. Well, and, and in every area, not just in caregiving, Yeah. what, what I find ha- happens with people who are caring for their parents is we get so focused on this is, this is my job right now. I am stuck here that we don't lift our head to go, oh, there may be other people who can help me. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and that's like you said, recognizing that there, there needs to be some outreach, there needs to be some communication Mm -hmm. and recognizing maybe 
I'm stepping over my own personal boundary because I'm allowing myself to get burned out. Yes. Right. And there may be a sibling who, who just doesn't pull their weight and whether in one way or another financial or just in their capacity. And at the end of the day, I guess we all have to figure out how to make peace with that too. Right. Well, it's another opportunity for God to show his grace. <laughs> That's right. We're back to that. We're back to yes. Christ-likeness. We're always yes. back to Christ-likeness. <laughs> well, right. as we finish out today, one question I have is I feel like a little more of a serious, maybe um, hard to think about question, at least it is for me. But, you know, as we look at like, how do we say goodbye to our parents well? Before I get real serious, I have a funny story. Okay, good. We'll lighten the mood for a moment. <laughs> okay. So towards, so my mom was 94 when she passed and she was ready to go for a long time. She was a believer and she just was like done. Like, God, why did you let me wake up today? I just want to <laughs> die in my sleep. So um, towards the end, my mom started, she was having trouble breathing and I was working out of town and my husband took her to the, to the emergency room and they admitted her and they gave her oxygen and all this did a bunch of tests. So I, I came home, went to visit my mom and, um, the doctor came in and, and he said, you know, he was kind of humming and hawing and, you know, here's what's wrong with you and kind of like really hesitant. And, and my husband said, just spit it out. You know, she's 94. She's, you know, what is it? Mm -hmm. And the doc said, well, Miss Charlene, um, you, you probably only have like a week to 10 days left to live. And my mom looked up at him and she goes, well, can you put something in the IV to like speed it along a little bit? <laughs> and the look on the doctor's face was like, because my mom was half joking, but you know, my yeah. mom had this very funny sense of humor. And the doctor just looked at her like, he says, we, we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. That was my mom. She you was head to Canada for that. Oh, well, yeah. right. She was funny up until the end. So, you know, her whole thing was, I want to die at home. That's just that's what I want. And so we took her home and she was on oxygen and we spent lots of time with her and being able to be with her for that last 10 days, she wasn't conscious for the whole time because mm. she ended up having to be sedated because of the panic. I mean, it's, it's really panicking, panicky when you can't breathe. Oh, so so awesome. here she is on oxygen, but it's not quite enough. And she's, you know, so she was on quite a bit of, um, suppressants, um, sedating, like, yeah, sedating, thank you. Yes, sedating, sedating medicine. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had a really good chance to my husband and I sit with her and pray with her, sing some hymns to her and say goodbye in a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. And that's not always possible. You know, when my dad passed, kind of the same thing, his, all of his organs started to fail. And we knew it because the, the doctor had told him you have, you know, just a couple weeks left. And we, so my dad, up until the time he died, refused to listen to the gospel. And on his deathbed, as he is struggling to breathe, I was screaming into his ear, daddy, I love you. You have to accept Jesus right now. It's not too late. Please accept Jesus ask Jesus in your heart, you know, here I am yelling into his ear because he's struggling so hard to breathe. And I don't know if he was, if, if, if I don't know if I'm going to see him in heaven or not, mm -hmm. but I mean, talk about two different ways of looking at life. When you've got a believer who's like, I am so ready to go into the arms of Jesus. And uh, maybe a non-believer who's saying, Oh, wait, 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 I don't want to die. <sighs> um, mm -hmm. Oh, such a contrast that um, I, I, I'm grateful, not only that I have both of my parents, I was able to be with them both when they died, but, um, just to be able to love on them and to let them know how much they meant to me and mm -hmm. how, what great parents they were. I mean, who doesn't want that? What a great yeah. legacy my parents left to me. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think about that just that moment. I mean, a lot of people have described those moments to me, you know, where everyone's in the hospital room and they're laying hands on their loved one, or they're all holding hands in a circle or, and there's just a beauty about it. There's a beauty about that. Just 
that we're all going to be at someday, but this circle of life and the legacy you leave and it's, you know, and that sobers us now, even in our midlife to say, where do we want to invest our time? And that's, you know, and just as an aside, God is so good. So, um, my son and I, so my son died like five weeks after my dad died and Mm. that, and that was in uh, 2010. And then my mom, my mom passed in 2017, but, or 18, I can't remember, but my 11, 11 was my son's and my time. So if we would look at the clock and it was 11, 11, we would text each other. It's 11, 11. It's Bobby time. I love you, mom. Or I love you, Bobby. It's 11, 11. And after he died, I, I got the tattoo on my wrist of 11, 11. So it's always Bobby time. And the time of death on my mom's death certificate is 11, 11. And that's just so showed me so much of God's grace of how much he loves me that it was so meaningful to, to know that she passed at 11, 11. Whoa. Only God does things like that. I don't know why he does. It's like, I don't know why he cares about the details like he does in our lives, but I've seen it too much to deny it, to say this right. isn't real. It is. Right. I mean, 11, 11. Are you kidding me? Like I know. Jane, that is like so beautiful. I am so like excited about and thankful about that for you because just that, like God sees you. He sees yep. Bobby. He sees your mom, right? And hopefully like, he sees my dad. Yeah. And maybe he's see yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm for that with you too. Well, yeah. Jane, thank you so much for coming on. Are there any just last words of encouragement you want to share? Just as you, as you navigate caring for your parents, I just pray that your listeners will find God's grace the same way that I did. It's just, it's abundant and it's there and it's waiting for us to tap into if we just will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your book, the caregiving season is, is beautiful and holds so much in it. And so we definitely will be um, sending people to places where they can find that. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Jane. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.